Welcome to the fourth chapter of Integrated Activism. Uh, Integrated Activism is a book uh, published by North Atlantic um, Publishers out of Berkeley, California that was released in, uh, recently. Uh, I am the author, Alexis Ziegler. Uh, this slideshow is, uh, covers the fourth chapter in the book, Peak Oil, Biofuel, and Genocide. So, um, peak oil has been became a popular issue a few years ago and it's fairly well misunderstood. Peak oil doesn't mean you run out of oil, it simply means that oil gets less efficient to extract uh, because the really efficient easy oil has been used up and we're increasingly turning to uh, dirtier more difficult forms of oil. Uh, this graph shows uh, the blue line at the bottom is the old oil wells uh, particularly in the Middle East, in the United States, areas where oil have been has been pumped for quite a long time, those wells are in decline uniformly, and uh, therefore uh, newer projects pumping dirtier oil uh, that requires more processing are coming online. So the overall volume of oil is increasing, but the efficiency of extracting oil is declining, um, and that is important to understand. Um, this is a graph uh, created by Charles Hall, uh, the balloon graph as he calls it. This one was created I think in 2005. And <coughs> it gives an excellent summary of the energy situation uh, in the United States today. Um, and of course this is all predicated uh, on the awareness that energy has a powerful impact not only in obvious ways on uh, the cost of gasoline at the gas pump, <coughs> but as we've been discussing in other chapters, it has powerful political, social, cultural impacts on our whole society, on global industrial society. So looking at this graph, the size of the circles in the graph does not do not represent volume. The horizontal axis on the graph, if I can get my cursor to work here, so this horizontal axis across the bot bottom is uh, the volume of energy produced in uh, exajoules, uh, which is simply a unit <coughs> of measurement of energy. So that's volume. And the vertical graph is efficiency. Um, so uh, energy produced in higher volume, the circle tends to land out here. Energy produced at higher efficiency, the circle tends to go up this way. So up here in the upper right would be the uh, place where you pr produce high energy, high, a high volume of energy at high efficiency, and the lower left is where you produce a small amount of energy at very low efficiency. Um, so coal, that big circle in the middle, um, the uh, height of the circle represents the variability or the uncertainty of different production methods in different places. So it goes from about, say, 50 to 1 up to 80 to 1 in terms of efficiency and is one of the biggest uh, suppliers of energy today in terms of volume. Um, if you look at the circle up here, domestic oil 1930, it was nearly 100 to 1 in terms of efficiency. Um, domestic oil in 1970 was down to about 30 to 1, but at higher volume. By 2005, domestic oil was down to about uh, no, 15 to 1. Uh, so you had to, you got uh, one, 15 barrels back for every barrel you put in, basically. Um, and decreasing volume made up for by imported energy, um, imported oil today. Um, you'll notice uh, some really interesting stuff going on down here. Hydropower and firewood are quite efficient, but not very much uh, volume. Windmills are also quite efficient, but also very small volume. Photovoltaic is uh, re de declining efficiency and much lower volume. When you get way down here in the corner, which is very small volume and very low efficiency, you have biodiesel, gas haul, gas -a -haul and tar sands. Um, they are abysmal efficiency and uh, currently low volume. So when people start talking about fueling the entire industrial economy with tar sands or biodiesel or gas -a -haul, um you're talking about a, a delusion basically. It, you simply can't jump from this corner of the graph way out here uh, without defying the laws of physics. It's just not going to happen. And another subject we'll turn back to uh, shortly is this, to this line here, total photosynthesis. So that is all of the energy, the volume of all of the energy, about 80 exajoules, produced by all of the plants in the continental United States 
uh, in a given year. So all of the domestic as well as wild plants, every leaf on every tree, every kernel of corn, every grain of rice, every grain of wheat, add all that up, everything that's produced in one year, and that's about how much energy is produced. In the United States in 2005, and I don't think this has changed very much in the last few years, um, <coughs> used 25% more than the total photosynthetic product of all the plants in the continent. So here again, if people start talking about, oh, we can fuel our economy with biofuel, uh, they're talking about defying the laws of physics, um, at least in terms of the current economy. Um, pet coke, the dirtiest of dirty fuels. So the result of turning of, of peak oil, of the decline of easily available oil, and turning to these dramatically less efficient forms of energy is that uh, we're using these dirty forms of energy. So there's been quite a bit of attention given to the Keystone XL tar sands pipeline with some good reason. Uh, the pipeline that would carry tar sands oil through the United States for uh, refinery and export, refining and export. The byproduct of refining uh, tar sands oil is pet coke. Um, it's a tarry, gunky mess that is still flammable but very dirty, quite a bit dirtier than coal even. Uh, they pile it up in these big piles. You can see the trucks moving around. If the wind kicks up, the wind blows it through the air. It's dirty, full of heavy metals, toxic stuff, being exported in large volume to China and other places where it's being burned, which is part of the reason they have claimed that the um, Keystone XL pipeline is not... Uh, a, a major carbon contributor because they're simply ignoring most of the carbon, most of the pollution. So this is the price of, of peak oil, of declining uh, oil, uh, the declining quality of oil in uh, oil wells in Saudi Arabia or Texas as we turn to this stuff. Dirty, dirty, dirty oil. Supply side renewables allow us to ignore pollution and externalities or meaningful conservation. So unfortunately, because of the political pressure to pretend we can maintain the industrial economy, um, there's been a lot of attention given to, to solar, uh, put it on your suburban house and it'll save everything. The grid tie solar movement has taken off with great vigor. Uh, the windmills, which are supposed to be so efficient, and uh, at the lower left there you see the most extreme absurdity of supply side madness, the hydrogen and veggie oil powered stretch Hummer. Seems to make it into most of the slideshows I do for some reason. Um, <clears throat> in any case, there are significant externalities for all of these energy sources, for every energy source. And externality simply means pollution. Um, so for photovoltaic panels, there's quite a bit of, uh, there are rare minerals involved. There are extremely powerful greenhouse gases that are used in, in cleaning and producing electronics, in including photovoltaic panels. So as a useful form of energy, when they're used at a modest scale, perhaps they're sustainable, but trying to power the industrial economy with them, <coughs> particularly when we simply add renewable energy sources onto the top of what we're already doing, there's no motivation for conservation. There's, uh, we ignore the externalities. <coughs> so this supply, this, the supply side uh, response to peak oil to energy constrictions um, isn't helping. It's, if anything, it's making, the, uh, making our problems worse. So let's talk about, there's, uh, every human culture pa practices a certain amount of, of self-delusion, of, of creating a cosmology that serves um, its interest. So we know what we choose to know, and we don't know what we choose to not know. Uh, that's true for every human culture. We tend to think of modern industrial society as being a very technological society. The reality is that our social technology ha it has not progressed. If anything, it has regressed. Um, and this is true for quite a number of things, including our understanding of technology itself and how technology has evolved and why technology has evolved. There's a wonderful book written back in 1973 by Richard Wilkinson, Poverty and Progress. Um, I highly recommend it. It kind of turns the world upside down in terms of understanding how the Industrial Revolution got going, how, techno how technology evolves. Um, what Mr. Wilkinson pointed out was that technology uh, historically has evolved in response to depletion and ecological pressure itself. <coughs> so he goes through a sequence of looking at various technological changes. Um, let's look at the technological changes around clothing in particular. So um, pre-industrial peoples uh, used animal skins for clothing. Now in the modern world of course that's a whole different issue, but back then 
animal skins were easily available, uh, relatively easily processed into very qu high quality garments. And certainly for the Inuit, I believe this is a picture of Inuit people, uh, there's no way they could have survived without good quality um, fur clothing. Um, now these days, of course, they're synthetics, but in any case. So back then, uh, high quality garments were easily produced from animal skins. As human populations grew and the supply of animal skins became uh, uh, insufficient, uh, humans began to use wool. Now the trick with these technological developments is, number one, they're based on the depletion of an easily available resource, in this case animal skins. Number two, they require going to a more sophisticated technological process that requires uh, more labor and more energy inputs to produce a garment that is um, generally inferior. So you go from uh, animal skins as wonderful fur coats, uh, and again, I'm not endorsing fur coats in modern industrial society, and that's an awful thing to do now, but back then it's a different context, a different time, a different place. But in any case, um, you know, to, con to convert from using animal skins to clothing to using wool involves shearing the sheep, w uh, spinning the wool, weaving the wool, a lot more work to get a garment that is still usable but not as really as high a quality. Uh, as the supply of wool ran short, we turned to cotton. And again, uh, more labor inputs, you have to grow the cotton at this point, uh, more energy inputs, much more sophisticated technology as we began to develop uh, these machines to handle the cotton to produce a garment that is inferior. Um, so that is the, the baseline of technological change. As we deplete, we turn to uh, resources that take more work, more labor, more energy inputs to produce often inferior outputs. In modern times, we've turned to synthetics, uh, but at this point, you've got to have an oil well, an oil processing facility, a chemical processing facility to produce resin that is then produced in the fiber. The industrial overhead of producing a single shirt or synth out of synthetic materials is massive. It is truly extraordinary, and the energy input uh, through each stage of this process not only is the labor input, the, the technological input much higher, the energy input is much higher, and of course you get into a labor energy trade-off where nowadays we put in a lot more energy just to save a little bit of labor. So the amount of e overhead uh, to produce synthetic cloth is massive, but uh, could we support uh, seven, eight, nine billion people with wool and cotton and animal skins? Well, it would be difficult, so we've turned to synthetics. So that's the baseline of technological change. It has been driven by depletion. It has not been driven primarily by, oh, we have some leisure time, let's make our life better. In fact, the standard of living huma of humanity, if you look at the, the archaeological evidence, one can make a, a very plausible argument that the peak of average standard of living for all of humanity was about 30,000 years ago. That's when every human being living on the planet had a good food supply and was healthy, more or less. And nowadays, of course, that's very different. There's a dramatic decline in average standards of living as civilization developed, as agriculture developed. Um, rich people lived well, and most everybody else did not. And this whole process of technological change has been driven by population growth, ecological depletion, and has carried us along a path of uh, greater extraction, greater technology, greater energy to produce a standard of living that is lower. Um, you can see the same transitions with energy itself. Uh, the humans uh, have been using fire for a long, long time since we were fully modern humans. The, some of the hominids started using fire. Um, firewood is easily available, easily processed. Uh, we, we've used it to cook our food and keep our tents warm for a long, long time. But what happened in Europe in the early Industrial Re Revolution, by the mid-1600s, they basically ran out of firewood. The price of firewood got so high that they started turning to coal. They picked up coal off the beaches where they could find it. Uh, they ran out of coal on the beach. They started to pick up coal uh, from shallow pit mines. The, they used up that coal. They started to dig deeper. Um, the... Uh, they used up the shallow coal. As they went deeper, the mines started to flood. Uh, as the mines were flooding, they used pumps to pump the water out of the coal mines. Um, at first, they used horse-driven rag and chain pumps, where you're pulling a rag on a chain through a pipe to pull the water out. Fairly crude sort of pumping system, but it worked. And horses themselves are, of course, a form of biofuel. 
or uh, biofuel made uh, manifest anyway, or made kinetic into kinetic energy. Um, <coughs> so as the mines got too deep, uh, the rag and chain, chain pumps started working, stopped working. Now it's interesting, we think of technology as driving society forward rather than ecology driving technology forward. Um, the picture on the left is a the first steam engine, and I ask people when I do my sort of public slideshows, when was steam power first invented, and people come up with something around the Industrial Revolution. Well, that steam machine you see on your left, that picture dates back to Rome, the Roman Empire times, about 8065, I think is when that picture is dated to. Um, the picture on the right was one of the first usable steam engines, and it came up over a thousand years later. That was not until the... Uh, 1600s that they started using steam power. Basically when those mines got too deep um, and they couldn't use the rag and chain pumps, uh, somebody said, well what about that steam thing? Because the steam engine had been, or steam power in various forms, had been invented and reinvented many times over the years and nobody had any need for it. Um, it, was a, it was too much work, too much trouble to do something that was more easily done with simpler methods. Um, but when those simpler methods were exhausted, they turned to steam power, and of course the early steam engines were quite inefficient, but the fact that it was right at the top of the coal mine where you could shovel coal into it, even if it was inefficient, was more effective than the rag and chain pumps uh, worked by the horses. So the lag between the invention of steam power and the use of steam power uh, was, was all about ecological depletion. In other words, had there been something that had stopped human population growth, had stopped the growth of of industrial society, we never would have developed steam power because we never would have needed it, and our standard of living would have remained uh, stable. Uh, the, the decline of standard of living in the early industrial revolution is quite notorious and pretty awful. Um, in the United States, we think of the Europeans came over and conquered the United States, took it away from the Native American groups um, with quite a bit of bloodshed in the process, and thus laid open a, a continent for the European colonizers to exploit, and they turned to biofuel, uh, just like the Europeans back in the home continent had turned to biofuel. This picture dates to the mid-18, probably late 1800s. This is a steam-powered log hauler hauling a monstrous pile of logs that goes off into the distance. Um, people don't realize it, but the United States was largely deforested. It went through the same transition that the Europeans went through the English in particular, in the early mid 1600s, we went through that in the mid 1800s. At that point, all of the easily accessible forests were cut down and burned, uh, largely for steam power. Um, and the price of firewood started going up so high that people turned to coal and went through the same progression of shallow coal, deeper coal, deeper coal. Um, so the ecological constraints of industrial development we, we reached the limit of the biofuel economy in the United States about 1850, roughly. Um, that's when firewood got too expensive. Now in modern times we've turned back to biofuel. In fact, Dominion Power, <coughs> which operates in the southeast where I live, um, gets uh, in tax credits for burning up trees to generate electricity, which if, you, if, if we were not so purposefully ignorant, we would understand the absurdity of that. We surpassed the biofuel economy in 1850 and now for cosmetic political reasons we are turning back to that biofuel economy. This is a massive tree chipping operation, cuts down trees in huge volume, uh, grinds them up. A lot of these tree chips are at this point exported overseas, some of them are burned for energy, some of them are made in a chipboard or other products or paper or whatever. Um, but these massive industrial operations generate very little in the way of employment and an enormous amount of environmental degradation. Clear cutting is horrific in terms of what it does to the soil, what it does to the land. But for political reasons, for environmental reasons, quote unquote, uh, we're turning back to this, quote, biofuel. Um, the, the ignorance that is driving this movement is <coughs> truly astounding. It's, it's really quite amazing to see the lengths we have gone to, to to hide our own history from ourselves, simply so we can flatter ourselves into thinking we're smarter and more important uh, than we used to be. Um, <coughs> this is a picture of mountaintop removal. Um, so as the peak of, if you measure coal by its energy value rather than by volume, we are past peak on coal production. In other words, the peak of energy production from coal in the United States was uh, 15 or 20 years ago. And now we're turning to more difficult to extract coal. This is mountaintop removal where they take a beautiful mountain range and blast it all to hell <coughs> just to scrape off 
a certain amount of coal and then leave it uh, radically degraded. So as we progress through these depletions and more and more uh, ex uh, intensive extractive methods, uh, there is an extraordinary environmental price that is being paid. The modern biofuel movement is a form of, form of collective psychosis, a purposeful delusion that seeks to deny the reality of limits and embrace the illusion of endless consumerism. Uh, so to go back to, here's another person, David Pimentel. You remember we were talking about this <coughs> line on the uh, <coughs> bubble graph that put the United States domestic energy production at 25% above total photosynthesis. Uh, David Pimentel is another one who studied these issues. He actually put it at 40%. So <coughs> there's a certain amount of uncertainty, <laughs> in particularly in these very big, broad numbers. Um, so different people come up with different numbers, but we are far beyond uh, sus what can be sustained uh, in terms of, of supporting the industrial economy with biofuel. And biofuel, of course, a lot of it is extracted from the agricultural system. And you have to ask yourself, uh, you know, what are the limits of agricultural production? Because with fertilizer and genetically modified seeds and herbicides and pesticides, we have certainly radically increased how much grain and other products we can produce off of a given parcel of land. Uh, but the limits in agriculture are far closer than most people realize. Over the past 1,000 years, humans have permanently degraded more farmland than the sum total of that currently being farmed. That's a United Nations statistic. So if you take, and the whole thing about grass-fed beef is pretty maddening as well, because it's, it's imagining that we can somehow uh, reinvent something that was invented a long time ago. About a third of the ice-free landmass of the globe is currently being grazed, <laughs> um, particularly when that grazing happens on uh, dry or somewhat marginal lands. Uh, as on the picture on the left, you end up with something evolving towards what's on the right, which is a desert. Um, the grass-fed beef business is, is complete madness. Uh, certainly in the western United States and all over the world, there's been radical degradation uh, caused by cattle and other ruminants uh, chewing up vegetative matter. Uh, the, the largest source of methane, uh, human-generated source of methane in the world, are cattle, ruminants in particular. Um, and methane being a very powerful greenhouse gas, 20 times more potent than CO2 on a 100-year cycle, 70 to 100 times more potent on a 10-year uh, cycle, uh, methane being more potent than CO2, that is. So <coughs> we're already having a massive impact on the uh, face of the earth with cattle, with converting uh, cellulose into edible food, uh, and that uh, the cattle of the rich eat the bread of the poor. That's a quote from Mohandas Gandhi. Um, so the idea that we can somehow ramp up grass-fed cattle is it's madness. It's a absolutely out of touch with reality. It's absolutely out of touch with the gross ecological devastation already being caused by ruminants. Um, let's look at other aspects of, if we're going to extract biofuel from the uh, world food system, uh, you know, what are the limits? Well, the world fish catch peaked in the 1980s. We're now well past the peak. We're harvesting or collecting or killing, whatever word you want to use, uh, far fewer fish than we did in the mid-1980s. Per capita grain production peaked in the 1980s. So even though we're producing more volume of grain, the amount of grain we're producing per person is actually, uh, we're actually past peak on that. Total per capita irrigated farmland. Now, irrigated farmland does not produce the majority of our food, but the per acre production is quite high. Um, so it's kind of the backbone of the global agricultural system. Total irrigated farmland per capita has shrunk in the last few decades. So the Green Revolution is in its, um, it's beginning to flounder. Green Revolution, of course, being the name, the broad name given for this entire process of uh, modifying, hybridizing, and, and now genetically modifying grains, applying chemical fertilizers, chemical pesticides and herbicides to greatly increase production. So the ramp up in production was very fast. The uh, We're now in a phase of diminishing returns. You can't simply add fertilizer <coughs> or add herbicides and expand production indefinitely. We've gotten to the point where adding more and more fertilizer does not uh, generate more and more grain. We are still expanding global food production. Uh, but it's, uh, it's not expanding as quickly as it was, and the inputs per unit of output are expanding, which is being noticed in uh, increased food prices, perhaps accelerated by grain speculation, as some people have pointed out. 
Uh, the final thing people don't think about, we know the U.S., we think of the world, the United States as being the, the breadbasket of the world, so the U.S. is the largest exporter of food and the largest importer. So you've got ships going in one direction and ships going in the other direction, uh, carrying food back and forth. We export grain, we import meat and vegetables and fruits. So we export cheap food and we import expensive food. Um, that's true, of course, to some extent for Europe and the other wealthy parts of the world. Um, so, you know, where's, where's all that energy to, pr to fuel these biofuel uh, vehicles going to come from? Uh, the numbers are absolutely maddening. Uh, it takes about 4.2 acres, 4.2 hectares, 10.4 acres of corn must be used to fuel one car for one year. Uh, the global grain supply of grain land per person was 0.23, notice the decimal, in 1950. Now it is 0.12, projected to be 0.09 per person in 2020. The grain needed to f fuel one SUV would feed 26 people. In other words, there is nowhere near enough grain land to feed our cars and people. Um, the numbers are just grossly out of scale. That hasn't stopped us, uh, being the wealthiest people in the world, from uh, promoting at a government level, at a local level, even all of these students driving their uh, insane biofuel buses around the country. Um, it's just absolutely out of touch with reality. There's not enough grain land to fuel biofuel buses or ethanol cars, or in the case of this beast, an ethanol SUV. Uh, absolutely maddening. It's simply the, the rich uh, grabbing the world's resources even more aggressively than they ever have in the past. <coughs> and the genocide part. Since 2000, about 5% of the entire continent of Africa has been sold or leased to foreign interests uh, for agribusiness and biofuel development. So about 5% of the entire continent of Africa is now controlled by corporations wanting to produce food and biofuel. Um, that's the seed of genocide. Uh, basically, you know, it's done in the name of development for the poor, but the poor and small farmers are either neglected or outright forced off their land. And uh, I've got all of the footnotes for this are in small print there if you want to pause the slideshow and look them up. Or you can get the book. It's all in the book, naturally. Um, so we do it in the name of development for the poor, but if the poor can't afford to buy it, it's pretty irrelevant. So as the market situation can continues to tighten, which it will, um, at this point I'll make a, a prediction that the constraint of industrial growth is going to be food and agriculture. Um, it's the sector of our economy that is most vulnerable to climate change, to the uh, changing patterns of rainfall being induced by climate change. Um, so it becomes a market-based genocide. Um, and if you've ever read any Susan George, How the Other Half Dies, was a book she published back in the 1970s. The, you know, we have the, an idea that uh, famine is caused by uh, in, uh, environmental catastrophes or, or whatever, at least in the modern world, famine has always been a market, uh, product of market fluctuations and who can afford to buy food. And now that uh, corporate interests are grabbing global land supply to, for use for products, uh, meat and biofuel for the wealthy of the world, then that's, that's the, begin the beginning of the coming genocide. And what will happen is there will be waves of environmental catastrophes, droughts followed by storms, followed by disease, that will sweep through the poorer parts of the world and will wring our hands and say, oh, isn't that too bad? But as the price of grain goes up in the coming decades, the, uh, the end of population, human population growth will come and, and we will enter the decline. And <coughs> it sounds kind of radical, but Lester Brown is actually a much more famous than I am environmentalist who has pointed this out as well. He's, his prediction is that human beings, human population will not make it to the UN predicted 9 billion, that we will face the limit of growth before we get to 9 billion. Um, we'll see if he's right. Um, I'm not going to make any specific productions, predictions about numbers other than to say in the coming decades the constraint of agricultural supplies is going to stop the growth of human population. Um, and we, of course, are going to continue to lie to ourselves uh, on a daily basis about where our technology came from, about how much resources we use, and about where those resources come from and at whose expense. So all of this begs a very basic question. Do we have an energy problem at all? Is the problem the supply of energy? So um, if this bulldozer and this truck 
were biofuel uh, were biofueled. What environmental environmental benefit would there be to that? So if that's a hydrogen and biodiesel powered bulldozer, what good does that do? Um, so in other words, if we could come up with a new energy source, let's say that um, somebody comes up with cold fusion and suddenly we have a massive new energy supply. So we can use that cold fusion to generate hydrogen to run, make a hydrogen powered bulldozer. That bulldozer, by the way, that's a D12. It's a caterpillar. It's a big mining machine. They use in the big mines. Obviously, it's quite large. So, okay, hydrogen powered bulldozer. What's, what, how does that help our environmental problems? Um, does giving heroin to a heroin junkie uh, help them overcome their problem? <laughs> Um, so we don't have a supply side problem. We have a growth problem. We have human beings for millennia, for all of our history, very tried very hard to constrain our growth and to deal with our growth and to deal with that growth in environmental context. Um, I've talked about that in other parts of the slideshow. We'll talk about that more in upcoming slideshows. But every pre-industrial human culture uh, had population limiting practices. We are living in a culture that has developed an ideology, a cultural practice of extreme environmental recklessness based on extreme extraction that is very short term in its focus and pump pumping in new energy supplies doesn't help that situation at all. If anything, it makes it worse. And, you know, of course, I'm not the first one to point this out. This, this graph dates back to the 1970s. This is the Club of Rome uh, report first published around 72, 73, somewhere around there. And this was back when computers were brand new and they simply plugged in to the best of their ability uh, the world economy as best they could understand it into a computer, uh, pollution, resources, industrial output, food and population to point out that um, if you have geometric growth, un unrestrained geometric growth, then somewhere in the mid 21st century uh, growth will stop and begin declining. This is uh, no big deal, although it is fascinating to realize this, this caused an enormous stir when this book first came out, and it was buried over time. Um, and you would think conservative pundits were the ones who buried it, but in fact, liberal magazines and liberal speakers would often speak negatively about the state of the world um, and the Club of Rome reports, <coughs> and they would grossly misrepresent these graphs. This is a very simple graph. You'll notice there's no units up the left side the units across the horizontal axis are centuries. This was not intended to be a precise graph and it was not intended to uh, represent any particular resources. It was intended to simply point out that you can have geometric growth within a closed system without a collapse at some point. So what would happen is in Harper's Magazine and other supposedly liberal magazines people would write and say, oh the Club of Rome said we were going to run out of XYZ resource at, X at a particular time and we didn't, therefore the computer model is all wrong. Well, they never said that. And uh, they have since written a few more books. Uh, the most recent one, I think, is the 30-year update, which was written in the early 2000s, addresses these issues of how of the original reports and uh, updated computer models, and as well as how these reports were buried or sort of r removed from the public consciousness. I think the most fascinating thing for me about the original Club of Rome reports, again dating back to the 70s and updated since then, was this graph where they simply made energy infinite. Um, so if you take the indu global industrial system and you make energy infinite, the graph kind of goes crazy. The, the curves are much higher, um, much higher resource availability. The curves get steeper, rapid industrial growth, the crazy thing is that the peak of human population, which is that dark line in the middle of the graph, only moves over a couple of decades. Um, it's not a big impact in the broader historical span to have a massively increased resource supply. Because what happens is we have more growth, faster growth, more pollution, and we have a steeper collapse coming fairly soon uh, in comparison, or not long after the collapse would have happened had we not had more resources. So the, the nature of geometric growth, particularly given the scale of human populations on this earth, the size of the earth as it is, being what it is, the size of human populations being what they are, more resources, more growth, more energy doesn't help. Um, we have a growth problem. We have a growth addiction. It is a cultural choice we have made that is very different than the choices made by other human groups for a long time. 
and of course the fact that we've developed this industrial society, <coughs> fossil fuel as it is, has allowed that growth to accelerate. And biofuel, as we have mentioned, is not going to help this situation at all. And uh, <laughs> I have to put this graph in here just to show that the, the Club of Rome did point out that if we stabilize human population growth, if we stabilize industrial output, then uh, we don't have to collapse. Collapse is not an absolute given. Uh, where do we go from here? There will never be any environmentalism in the absence of a reasonable measure of modesty. Nobody historically has ever built an effective social movement based on modesty, and that is our problem. We'll see if I succeed. I will almost certainly fail. But in any case, um, biofuel uh, is not going to save us from the constraints of energy supply and agricultural output. Uh, turning to biofuel will, if anything, make it worse. The supply-side focus of the modern environmental movement is not going to help uh, the constraints that we are facing. These constraints are going to have, are already having, and will continue to have a very powerful impact on our social culture, on our democracy, on our educational institutions, on women's rights. Those connections are immediate, direct, and powerful. It is the false agency of our leaders. The academics do not want to stand up and tell you that dirt and oil is more important than a college degree, so they lie to you, they lie to us all and they say that history is important in this way, and they talk about leaders, and they talk about how important academics and politicians and preachers are, and the academics, politicians, and preachers all agree that they are important, and we are left grossly misinformed and not understanding our own human cultural evolution. So, as again, there's a lot more detail about these, uh, this um, material in the book. Um, I'm going to go ahead, hopefully, and produce slideshows about the rest of the chapters in the book. Uh, thanks very much for listening.